Hi, I'm Amanda Baxter, and I wanted to take you on a little bit of a behind the scenes look at how I develop a color palette or a color story for my painted uh, warp yarns. Um, in my shop, you can find I have uh, a bunch of gradated painted warp yarns for weavers, and I develop all of those colors myself. I mix the dyes and I, I mix the colors and I paint them uh, based on recipes. And um, I've been doing a lot of really bright colors lately, and I love using bright colors, but I've had a, a hankering to make something a little bit more subdued and earthy. So a while back, I uh, reached out to Facebook followers and asked them um, if the idea of uh, earth hues or riverbeds sounded uh, more appealing to them and what kind of imagery that invoked. And I got really good responses from people. So um, overwhelmingly, people were much more intrigued by the idea of a riverbed color story. And I got some great suggestions from people. So I went with that for my next colorway. And that's what I'm going to show you. So the first thing I do, I haven't actually done this exercise in a long time and I'm, I'm excited to do it. It's, I find this to be very enjoyable and um, it's, it, it's, it's fun for me. And so I'm glad that I get to do this with you. I don't always do it because it does take extra time. And um, when I'm using bright colors, I don't need to worry quite as much about how colors are blended together, or what colors I'm trying to get to, uh, but with, uh, the mixes of colors that are a little bit more earthy, they're a little bit more complex. I, I wanna have a little bit more direction in what I'm painting so I don't just end up with a muddy mess. So what I did was come up with this color story for Riverbed. And all it is is just some taped together cardstock that I glued a collage on top of. And I started with some magazines, so I actually just went to Half Price Books. You can get magazines really cheap there. And then you have a great place to find photographs that you can cut up. And you know, depending on your, your taste, you can go for fashion or home decor, or I like using, uh, especially when I'm thinking earthy and of nature, I figured National Geographic and country extra and things like that would be good sources of information. So I picked up a bunch of magazines, flipped through them, cut some pictures out, decided that I wasn't getting quite what I had in mind. So I did a Google image search of river rock, river beds, different things until I came up with images that I found enticing. And I glued them all together into just this collage. And I think I even threw, these are actually, I have rock post-it notes because I actually have a love of of stones and rocks. So, of course I had those in there. They're down here. So, I put this this together and then I wanted to, I, I, I built a sort of color palette based on the colors I was seeing in here and combinations of colors that I was intrigued by. And also um, thinking about some of the ideas that the Facebook group gave me. So, uh, I, I put together this color story and this color story and felt a little bit more, I don't know, this this is more appealing to me right now. I actually think this one's very interesting and I may come back to this one later because I think there's some good, there's some, some good colors in here that I might want to use. But for now, and maybe because it's winter and this is just more appealing to me right now. This is this is what I'm going to do. So to make this part of my my color palette storyboard, I actually just raided my local hardware store and stole a bunch of paint chips. I have a problem. <laughs> I love the free paint chips at the hardware store. Um, I I think the last time I went in there, I made sure to buy laundry detergent so I didn't look completely crazy, but I do have a tendency to walk out of hardware stores with a whole lot of paint chips because I, I see th there's a lot of fun in being able to develop colors by just laying them out in front of you. And it's, it's and they're free, so grab some, they're great. Um, and then, so I, that's what I used to sort of, I, I picked and chose different colors that I felt kind of, um, matched the idea of what was going on in my collage and things that I thought made sense together. So 
this is the one that I decided that I'm going to go for. Then I keep samples. So because I mix my own dye recipes and I, I try to be at least somewhat consistent, I am working with hand dyeing. So there's always a little bit of imperfection, but I have recipes for everything. And I actually keep samples of all of my recipes in, in a box so that I can actually use them for this purpose. I can, I can use them to develop new colors and, and new mixes. I have a bunch. And I came up with some colors in my boxes that I felt were at least reasonably close to this palette. And I'll, I'll back this up so you can see. So they're not exact matches, but I feel like they're getting, they're, they're, they're getting there. And so I started with this, which I felt looked pretty good. And now I'm actually running some tests. I'm, uh, I'm trying to, do, I'm doing some samples where I'm um, altered the recipe on these a little bit to adjust and see if I can get a little bit closer to what I have here. So that's what I'm doing in my studio right now over there. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then after that, so once I've, once I've figured out the colors, figured out the recipes, I will mix together the dye paint and I will take one of my unpainted warps and I will paint them this new riverbed color. Then we'll let it set, wash it out, and see how I did. And here they are. So I've created a whole bunch of uh, little samples of yarns. This is my 5210 cell that I use. Uh, it's the only yarn I use right now. And I've made all these little sample skeins of yarn and I've labeled them with, uh, this is just a little piece of Tyvek. Tyvek is, is you know, pretty waterproof and it survives the dye process. And labeled these all so that I know what's what. And this, this whole process takes a little time. I have to mix dye powders and then I have to mix uh, a bunch of different colors together. And I have recipes that I follow that are really kind of specific, especially in these small quantities. So this takes time, but it, to me it's really worth it because then I have all this information about uh, how to mix my colors together to get the colors I want to achieve. And a lot of the colors I've been using lately have been bright ones. So now I'll have some more information about some good subdued earthy colors. And when I'm done washing these out, I I'll show you the final results and we'll see if any of them came close. Um, and I, I hope so, but I may have to do a few more tests before I know. Um, also, you know, I want to mention this this thing behind me so i don't if if you are a yarn dyer or just any dyer and you work with chemicals or powders and you want to work indoor safely this is actually something my husband helped me come up with and it's really ingenious all it is is a bench top blast cabinet from harbor freight and if you have a harbor freight somewhere you can get you can always get a coupon for something like this so let me, I'm going to post more information about that on my blog, I think, because this has been really, really useful for me. And it's, it's mobile, so it's on a cart, so I can wheel it anywhere. And it's got a shop vac stuck to it so that I can work safely with very concentrated powders and not get them on my body or in my lungs. Um, there's, it's, it's not the healthiest thing. So this, keep an eye out for that. I'll have to tell you more about that. So let me finish with these and I'll wash them out and we'll take a look at how they came out. Okay, so here's my dye tester samples to try to get a little bit closer to my chosen color palette. So I'm not going for exact match results right now. I just need some more information for when I go to mix my paints for my painted warp. The recipe that I use for painting is different than the recipe that I use for immersion dyeing or pot dyeing solid colors like this. So there's gonna be some variance, but this gives me a little bit better idea of how to mix my colors to get closer to what I have here. So I was really excited that this one, nope, it was this one. This dye tester sample came out really close to my chosen color. So this is, this is a really great one that, um, to give me 
closer to this color. And then um, I, I mixed a new version of this color. I felt like this color was a little bit warmer than I wanted it. I wanted something a little cooler. And the color that I ended up with is still, it's a little dark and a little warmer than I had anticipated. So when I go to mix my paint, I'll probably add a little extra black to it and try to be a little bit paler with the color that I blend. And then the other color I was really interested in finding was uh, a blue that was um, a little closer to this one. And I didn't really get there. I did manage to get a color that was a little bit more, it's, it's kind of hard to tell in this video, but this is actually a little bit, um, a little bit more periwinkle in color than this one. And so, and I think it'll be a little bit closer to this color if I can just make it pale enough. And that'll be the challenge I think with these super pale colors is, uh, mixing a very pale paint color that I won't accidentally oversaturate so that it comes out super dark. But, you know, it might actually be quite beautiful anyway. And this is gonna help me to figure out those recipes. So now I've got some math and recipe writing to do. And then the next step will be to actually mix those paints and paint it on a warp. Okay, so uh, you'll remember this is the color palette I was trying to get. This was the color range I was aiming for. And what I decided to do for this first run was actually, uh, I, I came up with the recipes for these colors and I decided to paint them in an order that would start here and then end here and then repeat in this direction. And this is what the first run came out looking like. Bring this up here for you to see. So I think it came out really quite lovely. It came out actually with a little bit more color than I was expecting it to. I was really expecting it to stay uh, more browns and blues, but I got some interesting pretty greens in there as well. So it did a fairly decent job for the first time coming up with this particular palette. The only thing I wasn't quite sure I liked was the lack of contrast. So the color, like this color here, came out much darker than this one I had intended to get. And this one kind of disappeared. And I think that just had to do with the painting color order, because the next color in line would have been this one. And that's blending into here and causing some green, which I like that, but I also wanted to see what it looked like perhaps if these two colors didn't blend together. So for my second run, 
I ended up starting at this end and working my way to that color and then going back in that direction to see if I could maintain some blues and some yellows without uh, losing this color in here. And I also wanted to see if I could lighten this color up to increase the contrast of the values in my, in my warp. So let's take a look at the second test run. So this is my second test run, and I'm pretty pleased with the uh, changes in the recipe that I made. I think these colors are a lot closer to my intended colors, and these blend really nicely into each other, so they don't get quite as lost or as murky as they did in the first run. There's some things I really like more about the first run. The, the varying colors are really beautiful, but overall I feel like this run has a little bit more contrast that would be interesting to work with, but uh, that is my own subjective opinion. What I especially like about this is, so I started here and I worked my way to this end and then I went back this direction. So I repeated in sort of a cycle back and forth. And since these colors repeat next to each other, you get this beautiful sort of um, undulation of blues in one section and then it gets really warm in another. So it might even depend on uh, what you are weaving with these colors. If you, if a run of this much blue would be too much or if having the color sort of subdued and undulate and then change in contrast would be preferred. But I'm pretty fond of the way these both came out, and I'm going to have a difficult decision deciding which one to move forward with. Something I'd like to mention, when I paint yarn, I always have paint left over at the end because I like to mix more than I need and not run out. Uh, so instead of wasting the leftover dyes, I like to take those dyes and use them on other yarn just to use them up. So in this instance, I took what was left from my first run and I poured it all into a mixed immersion bath and came up with this color. So in my shop, I have what I call cocktail colors and that's what they are. I just take whatever's left from paint, the painting process, and then I pour it into another uh, dive bath so that I don't waste that color. And so every time I do it, um, I can't ever paint exactly the same way every time. So whatever paints I have left over will dye the yarn a little bit different color, but they'll always be from the same color family. So they'll always be similar. They just might vary in tone or hue depending on however much paint I have left. So the first run I did, I poured into an immersion bath. And then just for fun, after my second warp was painted, I took what was left of the paints and I just sort of poured them and brushed them sort of willy-nilly on a couple of skeins of yarn. Um, so usually when I do a sort of variegated yarn, I am a little bit more meticulous in painting in a particular color order, but in this instance I just wanted to see what would happen if I just sort of didn't plan anything and just threw what was left on this skein of yarn. And I actually think it came out really lovely. I'm not sure if uh, I could do the same thing with all my other paint colors, especially the really bright ones. They might end up making murky colors, but since these colors were already subdued to begin with and kind of blend together really well, they actually came out really beautiful. So I, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with these yet because I, I don't really know how they'll work out in a weaving, but I think they'd be fun to play around with. Hi dogs. So I live on a cow farm in Spencer, Indiana, which is right now currently a real muddy mess. And in my backyard, I have this shed and the shed is my loom studio. I, I use a dye studio in Bloomington as well in, in town, but uh, when I am weaving, I am usually at home and I'm usually in my shed. So the pandemic hasn't been great for me actually organizing and keeping things clean. So everything's kind of scattered and messy as I've moved a lot of things around. 
uh, you never know what you'll find. So up there is a, it's an exercise bicycle spinning wheel my husband helped me make, which uh, is, you can actually find a little Easter egg in my um, old graduate school website. I'll have to, I could provide the link for that. That might be fun to see. Um, and then that's a spinning wheel from Japan for cotton spinning. And up there is a whole bunch of projects from when I was in school and a whole bunch of wool I eventually want to send to a mill to have spun into weaving yarn. Um, I'm not a sheep farmer. I'm looking for wool. I, if you know anybody that wants to sell me lots of great wool that I can have spun into weaving yarn, let me know. And then down here is my big AVL computer assisted loom. It's a CompuW loom if you're a weaver. So. I, I've, this is one of the first major pieces of furniture I've owned as a textile artist and it's been with me for a while now. And I hope this, this box here is a, it's a computer box, but it's from like the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, I hope it continues to work for me because it's, if it doesn't, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and then actually right now I've, just started warping a project that I'm doing in collaboration with uh, Roland Ricketts, who was my professor in school. Uh, he's indigo dyed this yarn, and eventually I'm going to have this set up to weave some lap blankets that we're using as tests for a uh, project we're doing. So stay tuned. Eventually I'll actually get this threaded and, and woven and I'm not sure where this is heading but it is heading somewhere so uh, I hope to sometime in the next year to update you on this project. And hint hint, uh, I have another collaboration I'm doing with Ricketts Indigo right now that you will be seeing in the very near future. So if you're um, may be interested in some indigo dyed yarn, you should sign up to my newsletter to find out when perhaps that will be available. So this is the loom I'm working on right now with the riverbed colorway. So this is my Maycomber loom, uh, which I recently acquired. I traded it in with a friend for, they, they, I had a, a smaller Maycomber, a little baby Mac, and I traded it up for this great, piece of furniture. I really love this loom and I'm really happy to have it. And look at this beautiful thing that's on here right now. Let's talk about it a little bit more, shall we? So to just go over what's happening here for people who don't weave, uh, when you go to my shop, you will see that I have a section of hand-painted warp yarn. And hand-painted warps are made specifically for weavers. And that's the yarn that is uh, changing this gra gradating in color this direction. And they've been pre-measured to be put on a loom for projects like this. And so it, the skeins of yarn that I have, the cones of yarn, they can be used for just about any purpose, but the the warp, the warp is something you use specifically on a loom. That's uh, what you call the yarn that's put under tension uh, this direction. And so my riverbed colorway is a paint, hand painted warp and it is the yarn that is going in this direction. Um, and then the weft that I'm using, which is the yarn that I put on here, is just a black. And it's the only color in my shop that I do not actually hand dye because I just can't achieve that dark black in my studio. So I have that one color commercially dyed. All the other ones I dye myself. Um, but I really like using black a lot with these hand-painted uh, yarns, especially with hand-painted warp, because it really helps to make the... the bright kind of iridescent colors pop. And so uh, I have chosen to use black in little sections of my weaving. And then also I'm using black in, in this, this section of the weaving that I'm doing right now. So uh, the way that this loom works is I have harnesses and these harnesses back here 
are what the warp threads are threaded through. So each one of these threads, which are several hundred here, uh, each one of them has a place in one of these what are called heddles, these little metal sticks. And they each ha are, are uh, threaded through one of these heddles on one of these harnesses. So every thread has a place in, in here. And then underneath, my harnesses are connected to these treadles down here, which are pedals that I step on. And depending on where the threads are on here and what order I lift them, the threads will come up and they will open up so that I can pass a shuttle in between them. And this is a shuttle, which is just, it shuttles the yarn from one side to the other. So I lift those threads and then I can pass my shuttle through. And then I have this beater bar, which serves two purposes. One is it contains this metal thing in here we call a reed, and that spaces the yarn out in a specific way, so that determines how dense or how loose my fabric's gonna be. And then it also serves to take this yarn that's on my shuttle and bring it forward to be part of my fabric. So I lift a space here I pass my shuttle through and then I lower those threads again. So you can see the, the thread, I don't, you may or may not be able to see that thread, but the thread that I just passed through is up here and now I'm going to pack it down on top of my fabric. Okay, so the way that this weaving works is there are sections of just plain weave and then there's sections of a weft face weave and for this section, I've chosen to do about 18 picks, and then in the larger section, I do 36 picks, and in the weft face sections, I'm doing 10. But the nice thing about the scarf is you can, the, the possibilities are endless for how you want to play with these blocks and how big or small you want to make these uh, weft face stripes. You could even play around with different colors. I like using the black with the black because it looks a little bit like stained glass that way, but you have endless possibilities for how big or small each of these sections are. So um, this is how I'm doing this one, but I think you should feel free to play and experiment with different designs. And I would love to see how different people approach this scarf project. So real quick, I'll show you a section with the weft face weave. So the weft fa face weave in this one lifts up harnesses one and two in the pattern, and it lifts multiple threads together as opposed to a plain weave, which would lift every other one. So that creates some extra space that you can really pack the weft yarn down into. So I'm going to use my shuttle and I'm gonna send this across. And the easiest way to get a good pack, because it's really important that this section gets packed really tight, is you create um, a diagonal with your thread and then before packing it down with the beater go ahead and lower the shed and then bring it forward maybe once or twice really hard and then I go ahead and lift the next shed while this is forward maybe give it one more good tap and since I'm doing a section with 10 picks I'm gonna repeat that nine more times so open shed I'm creating the diagonal. I'm closing it with the diagonal still in place and I'm packing it in really tight. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. All right. All right, so that's the weft face section. And in this, in this next block, I'm gonna do 36 picks of just plain weave is all it is. So what's happening is this is a, a, a warp faced weave. So when I do the plain weave sections, I'm using black and the black will sort of sit in the background of the color. And since it's, it's warp faced, uh, this, the warp will show up more than the weft will. So I'm not using, all of my threads are the exact same gauge, but just by the set, I'm creating more of a focus on the warp. 
I'm probably going to run out of uh, yarn here in a second, but I'll just go until I run out. I'm going to take a second. This is a guide string that I put at the beginning of my weaving to keep track of how far I've woven so I know when to stop. I'm just going to insert that here. Now I'll pull it tight. thread just then so I got to go wind some more but that's it I mean it's a pretty basic pattern you just repeat these sections of weft and warp and, and you get to determine how that's gonna look and since this kit allows you to weave two scarves you can experiment with two different styles um, something else you might experiment with in the future uh, different colors in the weft I actually was thinking about trying one with a dark brown. I thought that might make a nice warm scarf as opposed to this one, but I do really like the black a lot. I, I think it just, it, it allows the warp to be dominant in the colors that it's painted and it doesn't alter it all that much. It's, it's a nice color. So if you have any questions, feel free to email, um, email Amanda Baxter Studio or abaxterstudio at gmail.com um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Mm -hmm.